I, I want to warn you that right from the start, I go pretty negative till we reach about the midpoint. And I promise you at that point, we're going to turn things around and start offering solutions. That's what permaculture is all about, is solutions. So, I, so the journey we're going to take is going to take us pretty deep into uh, the kingdom of Mordor. Um, but I promise you that by the end, we'll return to the Shire. Uh, and be happy in the sunshine by the end of the talk. So, all right. For the last couple of years, um, I've been nomadic, uh, more or less. Or actually, I realize it's, it's been migratory. We finally landed in Sebastopol about eight months ago, uh, and we really, really love it and are staying. We really like it here. Um, I've been joking with my friends that I feel like I've been moving to California for 30 years, and I finally arrived. Uh, <laughs> And I'm very glad. But the last two summers, we have been living on a ranch in Montana, north of Yellowstone Park. Um, that's actually where I am right now, and I'll be back home here in about two weeks. Well, no, right now I'm here, but um, these days is, is where I get confused. We move around a lot. Uh, but where we are, we decided one day, since we're in that part of Montana, that we'd go play tourist, and we went to the battlefield of the Little Bighorn, and that's mostly known as, as Custer's Last Stand is the vernacular for the Little Bighorn battlefield. And I really came to understand, in just being kind of migratory myself, and the Plains Indians, the native people there were migratory, not really nomadic, but migratory, um, that the Battle of the Little Bighorn and all the circumstances around it really kind of encapsulate a lot of the traits and the patterns of our civilization. So I want to start with that, with a little bit of history um, to, to get us on the same page here. The, the history begins in, in 18, well it goes way back, but it begins in 1868 with the Fort Laramie Treaty, which essentially created the uh, first or one of the first really large um, Indian reservations and lands that the Plains people were supposed to be gathered onto in uh, 1868. And this was to be their land. It was an enormous area. Uh, took over a lot of Wyoming, Nebraska, the Dakotas, and into Montana. Uh, and the Great Sioux Reservation was the principal part of it that uh, the Plains Indians were going to be settled on, and that went fairly well for a while. But then in 1874, gold was discovered in the Black Hills, six years after the reservation was created. Gold was discovered in the Black Hill. Thousands of people of um, European and African descent began moving in, non-indigenous people. Uh, the army for a little while actually did start pushing those folks out and actually were honoring the treaty for a little while, but it was gold. Right, People were just swarming in, uh, so the army finally gave up, and a number of the leaders of the Plains tribes gathered their people. Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, uh, the Hunk Papa leader Gaul, and a number of other of the warrior chiefs gathered their people and took them into an area here. It's called the Unceded Indian Territory, which is a large place that, and I'm going to read this, um, no white person or person shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy in perpetuity. This was to be a traditional tribal area where they could practice the ways of life that they had lived for thousands of years, hunt buffalo, be migratory, and that lasted for two years uh, until the U.S. government decided that no, they really need to be moved back onto the reservation. Uh, General Phil Sheridan and Custer and a bunch of other soldiers, cavalry people came in and began collecting them and forcing people onto the reservation. At that time, Sitting Bull was performing a ceremony and he had a vision of thousands of headless U.S. Army soldiers falling from the sky like grasshoppers, was the way he described it. And he felt that this was an omen that it was time to engage in battle. And he gathered together about 7,500 people on the banks of the Little Bighorn in a temporary village there. And that is what Custer came upon. He saw this village. He'd never seen this many people gathered in a village like that. And he actually mistook 
the normal smoke from the fires and dust from horses moving around. He thought that they were breaking camp. He thought they were leaving, and it was, oh, you know, we got to get them before they get away. So even though they were greatly outnumbered, he attacked, and you know, that's the part of the battle that, that we mostly know about, was that he and, and his soldiers were, were wiped out by a numerically far superior sort force. And one of the survivors of the battle, there were, of course, many survivors of the battle. They were Native Americans. Um, this is a, a painting by Kicking Bear um, picturing the battle. And at the battlefield, uh, up until very recently, they marked the, the sites where the U.S. Army soldiers had fallen. This is Custer's headstone there, um, where he fell. And now recently, they have put in markers of where the native people fell. And the, the text here that you probably can't read very well, what it says is, this is a, a, man, a warrior named Closed Hand, and it says that he he died here, he fell here defending the Cheyenne way of life. And this was really what, what it was about. This was one of those true cases where they won the battle but they lost the war. Because of the terrifically humiliating experience of being defeated, the US government brought in thousands more soldiers um, and really did force everyone they could onto the reservation, killed or starved or drove into Canada, um, the rest. And so it was really the end um, of this, this way of life. And when we, we went to the Little Bighorn and this ranger was explaining the story to us, and he was a great presenter. He was wonderful to watch. And he had the backdrop of this landscape behind him, this enormous piece of land. Uh, and he pointed to the Wolf Mountains where Sitting, Sitting Bull had had his vision. He pointed to the ravine where the last of Custer's men were killed. And he told the story. And then he said, these were the freest people on Earth. And what came after this was barbed wire came in, fenced off the land. Uh, the land ordinance of 1785 was enforced, which essentially put a grid over the entire country of uh, the square mile section um, township and range system that we have which is a way of essentially turning land into real estate. Um, now someone owned every bit of it, and it was all settled. Um, and we've continued that process of dividing and dividing land until uh, we, have, we have settled the whole thing. So I stood on this hillside looking over the landscape that now has roads and fences and houses and cattle and, and looked over it, and I'd been spending quite a bit of time in Yellowstone, so I'd seen the, the bison herds that are now starting to come back. They're not the size they were. There were herds of one to two million bison were not uncommon, and now a herd of a thousand is a pretty nice herd. But looking across this landscape and the immensity of it and knowing how rich and productive and beautiful it had been, and I just, I was hit by this question, of why did we have to take it all? Every bit of it. Couldn't we have left, you know, that godforsaken chunk of Wyoming that was the unceded territories? And this, I think, really takes us to this clash between cultures that we've had for the last 10,000 years or so, which is when hunter-gatherer or foraging or horticultural people meet farming people. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the phrase farming people or agricultural people in, as I talk tonight a fair amount. And I'm not talking about individual farmers. Um, I want that because I know there's some farmers in the audience and I don't want people to start throwing stuff at me. Um, there are some structural problems with a civilization built on agriculture. And that's what I mean by agricultural people or farming people. Um, quite literally, some of my best friends are farmers. So um, I'm talking more on a cultural level rather than an individual farmer level here. But there's a conflict in that a farming people are terrified of the wild. A hunter-gatherer people, a foraging people, the wild is what sustains them. But when you're an agricultural people, the wild is where the deer come from and eat your crops, and the bugs come from and eat your crops, and the bears come and tear down your fences, and those wild people out there come. And Sitting Bull and his people had no use for our laws. I mean, there was nothing, and by, by our, I mean people of European descent, my ancestors, uh, had no use for these laws. There, there was nothing that the US government or agriculture could offer them. They really were the freest people in the world. And that is a frightening concept 
to an agricultural people. People you can't control, you have nothing to offer them, and so we exterminate them. That's pretty much our response to that. So what this transition from hunter-gatherer to agriculture really was, was um, our domestication. We domesticated a lot of plants and a lot of animals, but we're the most domesticated species of all. I mean, my dog is way wilder than I am. You know, I'm a lot more tame. So part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is this, this pattern of how we became domesticated and how we can rewild ourselves some. So I think we need to start with where did agriculture come from? How did we end up here? How did we get started on this path? And there, there are two main kind of classical theories about agriculture. And the first one is that people were living in places that were quite nurturing and quite abundant. There was a lot of food, things were, things were good for them. But because they were so good, we bred, we had lots of babies, as people tend to do when the conditions are fertile, and gradually outstripped the food supply and the land's ability to, to carry us. So we had to intensify food production to take care of us. So I think of this theory as, as life was good, but then it got bad because we, we over-harvested our resources. The second theory is that human beings were spread over pretty wide areas and things were fine for us. We were doing okay. You know, we were harvesting grains and we were taking care of ourselves pretty well. And then, and they know that, that this actually happened was about 12,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, the climate got colder and things froze up. So this is the, and then we had to intensify food production because the land was no longer producing for us. So this was the life was okay, but then got bad theory. So we have two main theories of where agriculture came from, really based on scarcity, on things got bad, and then we had to do agriculture. And those have been the dominant theories for quite some time. There are others, but they're all variations on that. A few years ago, the, the ideas really changed. The game-changing event in this was a site in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe, which dates from about 12,000 years ago, at least 1,000 or 2,000 years before the dawn of agriculture. And this is a, a site, it's about 20 acres, and it has 60 giant T-shaped monuments in it. They're 10 to 20 ton monuments. They're carved with lions, crocodiles, scorpions, vultures, a lot of really sc snakes, really scary animals are carved on these and it's, it's, it's bigger than anything anyone had ever seen from those dates. And it, it predates agriculture and this really tosses a lot of these theories out because what this means was that we were able to, human beings were able to create these very large sites that would have taken hundreds of people years to build very organized projects before agriculture came. So what it's starting to look like is that these spiritual gathering places occurred first and agriculture was more of a result of needing you know, to feed all the people there who were working on the temples um, and that sort of thing. Because these things predate agriculture by a couple thousand years. So agriculture may have emerged from really our deep spiritual need to gather and create monuments and places of worship together, that then those dense gatherings of people kind of outstrip the food supply, um, and we needed to then intensify food production. So what's interesting here is that all the pieces of agriculture were around long before agriculture showed up. We'd been gathering food, well, I mean, all animals gather food. We've had the use of fire to change the landscape, controlled use of fire for at least 800,000 years. So that's a very old technology for clearing. People have been tending plants for a very long time. This is a, a photo uh, of wild tobacco plants being tended in the Central Valley um, by the native people in the late 1800s, but there is plenty of, of archeological evidence showing wild plants that had been tended um, by people long before agriculture. And of course that makes sense. You know, if you have a plant that you like to eat or that you favor, you're going to pull the weeds off of it, you're going to take care of it. Uh, and also there are irrigation systems that come from way before agriculture of water being directed to wild plants, not domesticated plants. So these are all the important pieces of agriculture here. 
that were, have been in existence for many, many thousands or tens of thousands of years before agriculture. So why, why did it not come together until 10,000, 11,000 years ago? One of the things that went on is, is called the revolution in symbols. And this was about 40,000 years ago. The human brain evolved some extra layers of cells in the neocortex that allowed us to think symbolically, that gave us the concept of meaning. That before the revolution in symbols or before this part of the brain evolved, an owl flying by was an owl flying by. You know, you knew something about it, you knew where it came from and you know, all the tracking skills and the bird language and all that sort of thing. But after the, this part of the brain evolved, an owl could mean something. It could be a portent or an omen. And previous to that, we didn't really have the conceptual capability, the brain capability to think in that way. So we began to be able to think symbolically. And not so coincidentally, some of the earliest evidence of spiritual practice shows up about 40,000 years ago. Uh, this is a Venus figure from Germany that's uh, Schwabia that dates about 38,000 years ago. Uh, cave paintings from Chauvet Cave about 28,000 years ago. And uh, a carved bull again from Gobekli Tepe about 12,000 years ago. So there was this period of about 30,000 years where all of these things were developing. We were creating small settlements, you know, human beings were doing this, making art, tending plants without really domesticating them. The thinking that's going on and something, of sort of a theory that I really subscribe to is that what was needed was kind of hierarchy and organization. And if you think about how this might happen, if you think of someone who is, say, a a good hunter or a, a, has a special relationship with a plant that they gather really well, that they really understand, they're going to be a really important person. They'll probably be the leader of that hunting group. And that relationship with this creature becomes, in a way, a spiritual connection. That, you know, this is the person who has the bear totem. This is the person who has the salmon totem. This is the person who has the acorn totem. And so, it's pretty logical that that person would become kind of a charismatic leader of a small group. People would, you know, we're, we're drawn to competent leadership, right? If someone's really good at something, we will turn over responsibility to them, for sure. I mean, all herd and pack animals like us do that sort of thing. We're drawn to competent leadership. So this would be a leader with kind of a spiritual connection to a particular animal or plant and the next thing that goes on, and, and we certainly see it all the time, are rituals to favor that animal or plant, rituals to make a good harvest, rituals to make um, an abundant hunt. And pretty soon you've got totems being made, monuments being made. And what, what happens in this is the charismatic leader, I mean, if this is you, I mean, we like this kind of power, all right? I mean, people don't give up power very easily. And if we are directing a group of people to you know, make monuments for our totem animal and you know, give us some food and be nice to us and take care of us and all that sort of thing, that just keeps developing over, over a term. You know, we get better at, it's essentially the development of management skills, right? You, you manage a group of people to do projects and there's a spiritual connection which really gives it a lot of force because this is your survival. You're, you're learning about your food source, you're harvesting. You know, you're learning about an animal sense and you develop this, this, these sets of rituals that one person, the kind of shamanic leader, knows. So I can see this very easily going to monument building, temple building. So let me kind of just sum up these steps to domestication. Is the first step is you have a charismatic leader of some sort and there is a spiritual purpose. I'm not bad-mouthing spirituality or religion here. I'm just saying this is how that very powerful drive of ours towards spirit um, kind of can work against us sometimes. Um, it doesn't always have to, for sure. But the spiritual purpose gives this a lot of force. It becomes something sacred, so we start building bigger and bigger monuments. And that leads to a specialization of labor. Some people have to grow food for the people who are building the monuments for two or three or five or... 50 years or however long it is. So you wind up with specialized labor. Now we have settled people because we've got big monuments and big places that we want to stay. The population starts to outstrip the food supply because we have a lot of people gathered there. And so we need to intensify cultivation around this area where the giant monuments are. And with all of this in place, 
very quickly you're domesticated. We're dependent at that point. We're dependent on this whole structure. It's where our food comes from. It's where our leadership comes from. It's where our settlements are. It's where our shelters are. It's where our spiritual life is. So it's a very logical set of steps that we go through to get to this kind of dependent relationship on an agricultural civilization based on charismatic leadership. So the idea really that anthropologists are understanding is that the temple came first and then the city. It turns all this on its head. We used to think that agriculture allowed all of these other things to happen, but really agriculture comes from this spiritual need of gathering together in sacred places or creating particular sacred places, monuments. Um, and you can see that our culture does something very simple. We are temp very similar. We are temple builders. We build enormous monuments to whatever we think at that time is sacred. And right now it's insurance company buildings and finance buildings. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's all around money right now. Uh, but the religious impulse, the spiritual impulse, is certainly a very strong one. And certainly our, some of our longest lasting institutions are the churches. I mean, the Christian church has survived the collapse of Rome and the Dark Ages. and centuries and centuries of war in Europe, and they're very, very powerful um, institutions and essential in a lot of ways to us. They satisfy this deep spiritual need that we have. When you develop this turning over of authority to a charismatic leader, you give up a lot of your own personal power, and we do it pretty willingly. And I put up these different spiritual images here just in hopes of being able to offend absolutely everyone, um, <laughs> depending on what your beliefs are. But the idea is that we learn in this that power flows from another person rather than from the land um, or from ourselves or from our direct connection with spirit. Um, and in societies that are shaman based, it turns out that if the shaman is a man and the person who needs healing or curing is female, the most common gift that the that the shaman receives is sex um, very often. And the shaman will say, the way to, to, the way to heal yourself is to have sex with me. And if it's a male-male relationship or a female-female relationship, it's usually gifts being given to the shaman. And I'm not dissing spiritual leaders in that way or shamanic people or anything like that. It's just, it's what happens. It's, it's how we work. You make a sacrifice that appeases the, you know, the god or the deity or the totem or whatever it is. Um, through the shaman, through the priest. They're, they're mediators of that experience. So when you have this relationship, then what, what changes? One thing is that instead of everyone having a direct link with the sacred, it's mediated through someone else, through a priest. Uh, and I just, I couldn't resist this picture of Charlton Heston um, holding the, the Ten Commandments here. Um, so please forgive me for that, but it's such a great image. But, it's a, it's a mediated spiritual experience instead of a direct one. Instead of everything being imbued with spirit, only, it's, it's only in a few places, and it's particularly not, not around us anymore. It's in gods and goddesses um, or some other place. And one of the big ones is that instead of knowing that nature is going to provide for you, knowing that you know, when you're a hunter, gatherer, forager type person, nature becomes the enemy. Nature is where the bad stuff comes from. Nature is that wild land out there that you know, the deer and all of that come from. So it's this very, very different relationship with nature and spirit and everything else instead of a direct connection to all of these things. So it becomes very fear-based um, and very authoritarian very easily. So, okay, so let's imagine that we know all this stuff, right? We understand hierarchy and we understand power over and we understand, you know, that we've been disconnected from spirit and all those things. And so we, we fix all that somehow. We manage to do this. We still have agriculture and agriculture being a product of these things rather than the trigger for them, but being an actual manifestation of this disconnection Agriculture has some really serious structural problems in it. They're intrinsic problems and not just technical ones like fixing soil erosion and that sort of thing. First, if we look at the spread of agriculture, um, agriculture arose in a bunch of different places around the planet in different ways, but the principal center for it was in the Middle East and this was grain agriculture here. 
And grain agriculture is a particularly aggressive form of agriculture. If you're growing yams or even corn um, or beans or squash or something like that, you can just poke a few seeds or tubers in the ground kind of in any little clear spot and they'll probably do just fine. With grains, you really need to clear the soil, till the soil, and it requires a good bit of processing as well. So it requires large areas that are devoted really to nothing but grains as opposed to something like a potato or squash or anything like that that just sort of trail up around the, the existing vegetation. So it's, it's a, it's a clear-cut type of, of agriculture. It really requires um, a very aggressive treatment. It also spreads very easily because you clear the ground. You can do it almost anywhere, right? You can clear the ground and anywhere the climate will permit your grains to grow, you can grow them there. And what grain agriculture really means is you can store it better than almost any other form of food. You can store it for a long time, you dry it and store it. So this means you get a storable surplus and this is another huge game changer. When you can store a surplus of something, all these other things begin to happen that are, that are prompted by that, that are made necessary because of it. The first is when you've got, you know, you're storing food over the winter, you need a place to store it. You need a technology, you need buildings. You also need someone to make sure it doesn't get stolen. You need, you know, police or security or goons or whoever it is, somebody. So you need a security state to protect it. You need someone to parcel it out, and this is the Lord, and actually the Lord of the manor, kind of the, the origin of the English word, the old English word Lord is Flaford, which is literally loaf ward, the keeper of the loaf, the keeper of the grain. That's what Lord, that's the origination of the word Lord, is the keeper of the grain. So it's literally the person who controls your food supply is, is the Lord, the, the earthly Lord. You need accountants to measure it to make sure it's all divvied up fairly or according to the rules, um, which means you need rules to regulate who gets it and when, how it's divided out, and you need punishment for people who disobey these rules. So this whole set of hierarchical regulations um, and powers comes out of a storable surplus. So it's a pretty dangerous thing that, that horticultural, meaning pre-agricultural or non-agricultural people, and hunter-gatherers don't have anywhere near as much. Their hierarchies are much flatter. So a couple more things. I'm just going to diss farming for a while, um, just based on, on the agricultural civilization and the things that it does. It inexorably, it just, it's built in, in a population increaser. And the way it works is that you grow more food in a small area. That triggers people to breed. An ample food source biologically, being a biologist, um, is, makes women more fertile, raises sperm counts in men. When you have a good food source, it, it just does that to you. So you have more children, and then more people need more food, so you clear more land to feed those more people. And it's this positive feedback loop that goes on. Another thing about grains is that they can be converted into soft food, so you can wean children far younger than you can if you wait for their jaws to develop. That's usually age three or four before they can chew meat and things like that. And women who are nursing tend not to get pregnant. So by reducing the age of weaning down to very young, now you can have pregnancies pretty much as often as it's possible to be pregnant. And that has really been the pattern for a lot of agricultural societies for a long time. I was just reading a biography of Teddy Roosevelt a while ago, and it mentioned that both of his uh, grandmothers had 15 to 17 pregnancies, and that was pretty typical. So you can imagine the social effects of being pregnant from menarche to menopause pretty much constantly. Oh, and grains are very easily converted into calories, and meat is good for building muscle tissue, but it doesn't release a lot of energy when it's metabolized, whereas grains release a lot of energy, and that is the signal to breed, is getting that big energy dose. It says, we live in a really good environment right now, so let's have lots of babies. Another myth is that when we found agriculture, people lived longer and got healthier, and it turns out that actually the, the opposite is true. They now have archaeological sites uh, in Turkey and another place called Dixon Mounds in Illinois and a lot of other places where they actually have a skeletal record of people before agriculture and then making the transition into agriculture and here are the findings. People die sooner after agriculture comes in. The lifespan declines by between 20 and 30 percent. 
after agriculture compared to hunter-gatherer people. The same people in the same place, they find they die sooner. There are far more degenerative diseases. Uh, this woman here, uh, this Egyptian drawing or, or sculpture, she is using something called a quern, which is a kind of a rolling pin that you use to grind with. And you, you can see what she's doing. She's kneeling on the ground and she's rolling this thing back and forth. And you do that all day. So you can imagine the repetitive motion injuries that you're going to have. Spine problems show up, arthritis shows up, wrist problems, knee problems, neck problems that don't exist in pre-agricultural people through this really repetitive labor. Far more epidemics. Those of you who've read Jared Diamond's great book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, most of our epidemic diseases, not all, but most of them, come from domesticated animals, chicken pox, uh, smallpox coming from cows, measles and mumps coming from pigs. Uh, so w far more epidemic diseases begin to occur. People got shorter after agriculture. Um, both men and women lost about four inches in height after agriculture came along in those same sites that have that clean record. And another myth that needs to be overturned is that famine becomes much more common after agriculture. That, that foraging people can pretty much always find food and their population numbers are lower so they're not putting the pressure on the land. And they can, they can find food even in really bad conditions whereas if you have a bad crop year, um, speaking of this year, um, sure looks like it, there is no food. And so there's a relationship between farming and famine. Uh, the great French historian Fernand Brodel was one of the first historians to look at how regular people live, not just uh, the, the lords, the kings and queens, but how the average person lived in Europe. And here's the record of famine. We've got seven major famines in the 15th century. These are the 13, 11, 16 famines in the 18th century, continent-wide, killing 20 to 30 percent of the, of the population. You know, 16 continent-wide famines in the 18th century. And that's not including the minor famines, the local famines. So agriculture does not prevent starvation. It actually increases the odds that you will starve. Farming consumes a lot more land than just its footprint. You have the crop land, but you also need a lot of land for the animals, fodder, um, fertilizer, if you, unless you're using fossil fuels, but to grow the fertilizer crops. John Jevons up in uh, Willits calculates that you need roughly four acres of fertility producing land to have one acre of crop producing land. So it's a much bigger footprint than it looks like. Then you need lands for mines and timber and all the supplies and things like that. And then you need land to house the people who are working on the farm as well. So it's got a way bigger footprint. Agricultural people work really hard. Uh, foragers can gather a week's worth of food in three to four hours in a good environment, whereas a farmer needs a lot more time to gather food. It's really hard work. And so there, it's not a coincidence that when Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, God said to them, thou shalt earn thy bread by the sweat of thy face. Now, it was going to be hard work now for them. Farming societies are not very diverse compared to hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, hunter-gatherer societies, if you compare, say, the Yanomamu in South America with the Inuit, with the San Bush people in Africa, they are so different that they don't even have words for many of the things that they do differently. Whereas farming people are fairly uniform. There's definitely some diversity. But industrial people, the subset of, of farming called industrial people, there's really only one industrial culture, right? That's the McDonald's culture is pretty much all we really allow. So not as much diversity. Agriculture is portable, as I was mentioning before. You can you just clear the land so you can spread it. Uh, it leads to conquest. If we look at how agriculture has been spread, particularly grain agriculture, when it moved from Europe to North America, that's pretty typical of how grain agriculture spreads. Uh, that was not a nice story, and it's, it's pretty typical. The farmers move, not just farming, but the agricultural people move along with their crops and, and take over the land. So, agriculture is essentially the process of taking land that looks like this, you know, beautiful wild land, um, usually setting fire to it has been the traditional way. This is a sugarcane um, plantation about to be put up in the Brazilian rainforest. 
um, for ethanol, and then it's turned into this. Um, it's made pretty uniform, especially grain agriculture. So what it's doing is it's, I mean, that's not a functional ecosystem, right? A cornfield, a wheat field is not a functional ecosystem. So it's the process of taking apart these ecosystems and simplifying them into, even if you've got a polyculture, but a monoculture in particular. And the feedback from this damaged ecosystem is way too slow for us to really recognize. It can be generations of soil erosion and depletion and it's actually the process of converting the, you know, mining the soil and turning it into food that is really what we're looking for with agriculture. Just to kind of sum this up, agriculture farming is really the process of turning ecosystems into people. That's, that's essentially what it's doing. I have not enjoyed finding this stuff out. I really haven't. Uh, it's, not, it's not been fun for me because um, I like farms um, a lot. An agricultural civilization is based on a dichotomy between the tame and the wild. You know, most agricultural, or sorry, most non-agricultural people don't have a word for wild. They don't have a word for wilderness. It's not really a concept. There's no place that human beings don't have a role um, in non-agricultural societies. Um, and actually, the, the root of the word bewildered means to have your mind confused by the wild. Right? So it's a, it's a place of confusion. Um, a people who hold wilderness as separate from them the way we do are going to destroy it. Think of the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. You know, okay, that's sacred, right? We don't belong there, hands off, except we really need that oil. Right? And, that's, and that's the inevitable process. It, it will happen if we don't, if we hold wild land is something separate from ourselves, we will destroy it. If we hold wild land as something that supports us and nurtures us, a place that we belong and that we care for, then, then we will not destroy it. And I, I really like um, Derek Jensen's quote about this, where he says that if you, if you think that your sustenance comes from the store, and it comes from a tap, and it comes from your job, then you will defend that system to the death. And if you think that your sustenance comes from the land, you will defend that to the death. So we've, we've become people who believe that our sustenance comes from the store and from our wallets and that sort of thing. So it just, it leads me to the conclusion that there's really no such thing as sustainable agriculture. Agriculture has had a great 10,000 year run and it's been really good for human beings. And there's been a lot of benefit and a lot we can learn, but we don't have another 10,000 years. I mean, I, I guess the way I think of this is name one ecosystem that's better off for having agriculture move into it. And there aren't any. What's hard for me to grasp is if we have a culture that can do this sort of thing, these are just some of my favorite personal cultural icons of, of Gandhi and Mother Teresa and Michelangelo's Pieta um, and Beethoven's symphonies, but you can plug your own in here. Why is it that a culture that can do this sort of thing ends up doing, I mean, this is what you got? This is the epitome of our culture? Because this is what really we live in, right? I mean, you look out there, it looks a lot like this. A little nicer, because this is Petaluma, but it basically looks like this. So the reason is that, a, that I, I really believe that a culture that is disconnected from nature goes insane. A people who have no direct connection to nature lose their minds. Whereas if we make nature the center of our lives, it's a very different relationship. We, we make sacred the things that we think support us. So these are the things we've made sacred. So just to kind of sum up and okay, we're, here's the nadir, here's the, you know, we're, I'll hand out the razor blades um, <laughs> at this point. So a, a civilization based on agriculture does all of these things. Now we have this culture based on fear, uh, the wild is a scary place, the bosses are scary, um, it's a, a culture driven by fear. How about something different? And I'm talking, I'm going to talk about sustainable horticulture as opposed to agriculture. And I actually have come to the conclusion that permaculture is really kind of envisioning a horticultural society as opposed to an agricultural society. Um, and, and so what I mean by that, and, and anthropologists talk about horticultural societies as, as, as people who tend to plants and garden, but not really farm. A little farming, a little hunting, but mostly they're plant tenders. 
um, rather than, than farmers, they're gardeners. And the, the origin of the word horticulture is the root of the word is hortus, meaning plant. Agriculture, the root is agar, meaning field. So it's plant culture as opposed to making fields. So some of the qualities of horticultural people and horticultural societies, we're talking about gardens rather than farms. We're talking about small tools like hoes and digging sticks as opposed to plowing large areas. Um, much smaller scale, crops are mixed. It encourages that natural process of succession. Annual agriculture sets succession back to a clear cut every single year, whereas there are many forms of horticulture of gardening type plant growing that allow succession to occur. We like fruit trees, we like berry bushes, we like all those later successionary species. The ecosystem still function. I, the place I really got this was I was teaching a permaculture course in Belize and we went across the river to a Maya farmer's farm, as, as he called it, and he had a little patch of corn, maybe a quarter acre of corn, and that was his cash crop that he traded for money. But he brought us to his house in the middle of the jungle and he said, how do you like my farm? And I looked at this, you know, this is a jungle, what are you talking about? And, and actually there were jaguar tracks right outside his front door. A jaguar had gone by the night before. There were morpho butterflies with you know 10 inch wingspans flying around and um, progons and all sorts of amazing birds in the trees. It was unbelievable and he called it his farm. And then I realized, oh wait, um, that's a mango. That's a tamarind. Those are coffee bushes. Those are nitrogen fixing plants. Those are medicinal. Those are bananas. That's some citrus. That's some more citrus over there. That's a cacao tree with a vanilla bean twining up it. That's a nice, lovely little guild there. Chocolate and vanilla. And, and I, I realized he had, he had created this ecosystem except that it provided a lot of stuff for him while providing really, really wonderful habitat. And the further you got from his house, the, the less domesticated, the wilder it got. So we can do this. We can create these places that support nature while they support us. And that's what I mean by a horticultural society. Rather than converting ecosystems into people, we can leave the ecosystems and still have the people. Um, Horticultural societies, non-agricultural societies tend to be much flatter in hierarchy also. You have direct, usually direct access to the boss as opposed to, you know, go ahead and try and get a meeting with Obama, right? Um, the one that really got me thinking about this whole thing was that agricultural people tend to locate their deities in the sky, whereas horticultural and hunter-gatherer people tend to locate spirit here on earth. The earth has spirit and the trees have spirit and the rocks have spirit and you know, spirit is surrounding them rather than somewhere, somewhere else, somewhere off in the sky. Um, so it's earth spirits instead of sky gods. And what made me see this was, although when I first started teaching permaculture, I was noticing that although many of the, the students were from the same kind of Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic religion background that, that I'm from, they spoke in terms of Mother Earth and Earth Goddesses and Gaia uh, and, and these sorts of things. And at first I was really confused. I just thought, okay, why are my courses attracting all these pagans? You know, what, what is it about permaculture that's drawn you know, all, all these, these pagan types here? And I think this is it. I think these are people who are naturally drawn to a more horticultural type of society where spirit um, is all around us. There can be sky gods still, but, but this is full of spirit as well. So I want to talk about what permaculture is for a little bit, just to get us all on the same page. Um, it starts with a set of ethics. It's a contraction of the words permanent and culture, um, originally permanent agriculture but we really, the folks doing it in the beginning quickly figured out that you can have uh, an agriculture that is more or less sustainable, but if it's embedded in an unsustainable culture, it doesn't really matter. So permaculture, unlike many other design methods, actually starts with a set of ethics. And those ethics are, before you do something, you ask, does it care for the earth? Is it gonna leave the earth a better place? The second permaculture ethic is, does it care for people, whatever it is you're planning on doing? And then the third ethic is that if you do it right, it's going to generate a surplus. So that surplus needs to go back to the systems that generated it. You need to return or reinvest the surplus. And where those three things intersect is permaculture. So 
It turns out that if you care for people, or if you care for the earth, that tends to make people better off, and vice versa. If you care for people, they usually take better care of the Earth. The Earth is so abundant that if you care for it, she will generate a surplus. And people are so amazing and creative that if they are cared for, they will generate a surplus. And then that surplus goes back to support the systems that start it. So that whole surplus to close the loops thing, returning the surplus, is very important. Um, the thing is, how do we know what surplus, right? Return what surplus? You know, I need it all, right? Um, who is it? Mr. Burns in The Simpsons says, I'd trade it all for just a little bit more. <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, how do you know? How do you know that, you know, the rainy day is going to come tomorrow and you won't have enough? So what, how permaculture works with that is that we're based, permaculture is based on observing natural systems. And if you observe natural systems, they are abundant. And I don't see a lot of scarcity out there in nature. You know, we take some plant cuttings and put them into pots and they grow into whole plants. You plant a package of seeds and you have thousands of plants from one teeny little package. Now we're talking about the natural abundance model, the productivity and the beauty and the abundance and the creativity of nature. We're trying to model that. When we mimic ecosystems, we can tap into their abundance as opposed to destroying them. So some strategies that we use in permaculture, just things that we do, the ways that we think, it's really a transformation in thinking. We recognize that life creates conditions for life. You know, you plant a seed and a little plant comes up and that harvests some sunlight and that grows even bigger. So it harvests more sunlight so it can grow even bigger and harvest even more sunlight and then it creates really good habitat and it builds soil and other things move in. I mean, that's how life works. It creates conditions conducive to life. So I want to go through a few permaculture principles and um, catch and store energy and materials. We are awash in flows of energy and materials all the time, particularly in urban areas, really rich in resource flows, people as well as things. And so catch them, store them the way nature does, just like that little plant that's growing, catches some energy, uses it to build more, catches more energy, uses it to build more. So I was at a, a school in the Bahamas for a while um, on a Luthera Island that was in a pretty remote area, didn't have a sewage hookup, and you couldn't build a conventional septic system because the soil was just ground up coral. So anything that you flushed into the septic system was really just going to go straight into the water. It was on a little peninsula with water all around it on three sides. So we couldn't build a conventional septic system. So what folks did was to take all the toilets from the, the dormitories with about 100 or so students in them and run all those lines together and run it into a conventional septic tank. And then the effluent from the septic tank then went into these two concrete pits. And what we did with the concrete pits was we filled them full of ground up coral and then planted them with all sorts of stuff. And here's one of them the day after it was planted. The things are just getting going. Now it's getting a lot of water. It's getting a lot of nutrients, right? A lot of nitrogen from human waste and phosphorus and things like that. It's warm because it's the tropics. It's getting plenty of sunshine. So here it is the day that it was planted. Here it is three months after it was planted. This is one of the lagoons. And here it is three years after it was planted. So this is human waste being converted into incredible amounts of biomass. This is 10 degrees cooler than anything around it. It's shady, it's lovely, it's full of butterflies and birds. It doesn't smell. It's a black water treatment system that's just absolutely incredible. So we're taking something we normally abhor and turn it into something really wonderful. Some of the donors, the founders, um, the financiers of the school came down while I was there and we took them on a little tour and walked right through the path that goes in the middle and then stopped in the center and explained to them what was going on. And they were kind of, oh, that's really disgusting, but, but it's so beautiful. You know, just this, I mean, that's, that's what happens in these. These can be beautiful systems. They're, they're just starting to build these now. The problem with them is they don't cost enough. They're not temple building projects, right? They're not giant things that, you know, everybody makes hundreds of millions of dollars off of them. They're really simple and really easy. So they're, they're, you don't float a bond issue to, to build one of these. You can do them really, really cheaply and simply. So another permaculture principle is that we try to f learn enough about the system we're dealing with to intervene in a place where a little change can have a really large effect. 
And this is a set of projects up in Portland, although it's spread to a lot of other cities, done by a group called City Repair, a really wonderful nonprofit there, founded by a brilliant man named Mark Lakeman. He lived in a neighborhood where they got to, he lived on a corner, and he got to know the other three neighbors on the other corners, and they thought about, wouldn't it be great to kind of have a little village here, because we like each other. And so they put together this plan of, uh, first they wanted to get a traffic circle to slow down traffic, but the city said, the two ways to get a traffic circle, you either pay us $10,000 and we will build you one, or if there's a fatality at the intersection, we will build you one. And they kind of, you know, they look for volunteers. But. So they went back and literally went back to the drawing board and figured out this idea of painting the center of the intersection was how it was going to start, painting it into kind of a fake traffic circle. And then as they thought about it, they thought, well, really what we want is a village. Wouldn't it be really cool if, like, and so one neighbor said, well, I, I can build a, like a free box library so that there can be a, you know, a, a, essentially a, a market in a way, a little place for people to trade and, and give stuff away. And someone else agreed that they would put up a little table around a, po a pole that was there and hang a bunch of cups on it and bring out a thermos that was chained to it every morning full of hot water, a carafe, and that the neighbors could have tea in the morning. And someone else offered to build a children's PlayStation. And someone else on the other intersection offered to build an information kiosk for the neighborhood. So they went to the city with this proposal uh, to the Department of Transportation who owns the intersection. And the DOT people said, well, we've never seen anything like this, and we don't know how to permit it. And besides, it's public property, so you can't use it. So fortunately, there was someone in the DOT who thought this was kind of, he overheard it, and he thought it was kind of a neat idea. And he said, you know, come here. I mean, I can't give you a permit to do that, but I can give you a permit to do, to have a block party, to seal off the intersection for a weekend. And if something happens, so it was kind of the, you know, it's better to ask forgiveness than permission sort of thing. So they did this. Um, they put this together. Here it is after it was made. And uh, just incredible things began to happen. Here's the T station that they made. Um, here's, one, here's a different intersection that was painted. This was a bench that they put in in someone's front yard, right? A bench in the front yard to invite strangers to sit in your front yard. Um, a, a concrete wall that was covered with a lovely mosaic. And a whole bunch of other nice little things happened that weekend. This is actually a collage of several different projects. but. That's what happened. And then on Monday, someone from the DOT happened to drive through the intersection, which is, oh. And they, they were originally going to be charged with vandalism and sandblasting. You know, they're going to be charged for removing all of this stuff. But fortunately, someone brought in Portland's mayor, this amazing woman at the time named Vera Katz, who looked at this. And she said, OK, let me get this straight. You're slowing traffic. You're creating community. You're probably raising property values, because this is really neat. You're reducing crime because there's a presence of people here now. And it looks great. And she went on and ticked off all these other things and said, these are the city's values. This is what the city of Portland is striving to do, all of these things that you've just done. And it didn't cost the city a cent. So there is now an intersection repair ordinance in Portland where you can do this. Um, you get the right number of people to sign a petition in your neighborhood, and you can do this in an intersection where all four neighbors agree. There are 34 of them now in Portland. Um, they're happening in Eugene and Seattle and in a number of other cities. There are chapters of city repair in a lot of different places where this is going on. But it's turning the city back into a village, a series of small villages. So we're learning how to become indigenous in our cities again. So I think another important piece is the whole idea of self-sufficiency, which was kind of where a lot of folks went in the 60s and 70s and later learning to be self-sufficient, develop all these skills. Uh, this is actually a photo from the Path to Freedom folks down in Pasadena, um, where they're growing 8,000 pounds of food a year on a quarter acre. So amazing productivity. And their, their idea is to be pretty self-sufficient. The, the thing about this is, I mean, one thing I hear in permaculture a lot when folks are taking a course for the first time, one of the questions they really want is, how much land do I need to grow all my own food? You know, how do I grow all my own food on my own property? That's the first question that a lot of people ask. And I kind of wondered about this. You know, where did this come from, this idea that we need to be producing all of our own food? I mean, I felt it too. I wanted, you know, thought that would be a noble goal, to grow all of my own food. And I think it comes from our, you know, the, the settler, the pioneer, truly self-sufficient model that we have in our histories. 
But if you think about it now, you know, the idea that your property should be, I mean, there's no ecological boundary of your property line. It was, you know, a developer or somebody who drew a line around something. So why would you limit yourself to growing all your food in that kind of an arbitrary space? And I think really the question that we're trying to get to, oh, also when you kind of parse this, you know, I want to grow my own food on my own property, right? It's like, it, it kind of bugs me. So, but when you, when you think about it kind of permaculturally, okay, what's really going on here? What I think really is going on is I want to meet my food needs sustainably, reliably, in a way that I can trust, right? So, so if we think about that in a permacultural sense, you know, it really means more community self-reliance or regional self-reliance rather than individual self-sufficiency. It's a, it's a very different way of looking at it. And those to me seem like wonderful goals. So permaculture has a tool that can kind of help us with this that we, we talk about zones. Uh, and and well, I know folks are familiar with the term food shed. With the idea behind zones are simply that um, the areas closest to where you are are the places you spend the most time, so you try and do as much as possible in the, the places closest to you, and further away you use them less often. You know, like in, in a garden, in a yard, it would mean kind of plant your herbs and your salad greens really close to the kitchen door, and then other things can go a little further away. So if we apply the zone system to our food shed, the innermost zone, zone one, would be your garden. And for those of you who are not garden, gardeners, that's okay. Um, but, you know, produce whatever makes sense for you to produce in your own garden. And then what you can't produce in your garden or just choose not to produce in your garden, your neighbor's gardens, community-supported agriculture, uh, community gardens, those, that would be the next step out. Those are close to you and easily available, but a little further away from your garden. So that's kind of zone two for food production. That's the next place you go. If you can't satisfy your food needs there, then you go out to zone three, which are farmer's markets, places where you can at least meet the farmer even if you haven't seen the place where the food has been grown. So you know quite a bit about it. You can influence the farmer. You know, I'd love to see these varieties or I'm hoping to use these practices, that sort of thing. And then zone four would be regional markets, local markets that support local farmers. Um, lots of food stores like that. And then, if you can't meet your food needs in zones one through four, okay, then you go out to you know, Costco, Safeway, those sorts of things. But hopefully you've met all your food needs in zones one through four, and you never need to go to those places. Another tool that I'm really, really encouraged by are the food sovereignty laws that are starting to crop up various places. Um, Maine and Vermont, you know, the live free or die type states in particular, they're passing ordinances that say, we in this community have the right to grow food, sell food, process food, and all you have to do is make an agreement between buyer and seller, and that's what really matters. I mean, that's a free market, right? And they, they have a, a clause in these food sovereignty laws that says no other laws will apply. Federal laws, state laws, those cannot overturn our food sovereignty laws. You know, I wanna be able to drink raw milk, right? So let's look about at energy. We've talked about food for a bit, so I want to just think of energy in permacultural terms, you know, the old oil wells. Uh, the technologies for energy have really changed. I mean, I have an illustration here showing how um, deep sea wells are now produced. You go out with a ship and you do um, a lot of bouncing sound waves deep off the, the, the Earth's crust and listen to the differences and figure out where the oil is and then you, know, you drill down and then you bring it in on a pipeline and then from the pipeline you bring it into a processing station. Well, what this really means is that as far as energy production is concerned, we go out and we hunt for energy and we gather it and we bring it back, right? We are still hunters and gatherers of energy at this point. We are still back in the Stone Age as far as energy is concerned. Energy farming, except I've just gone through this whole thing about agriculture maybe not being sustainable, so I don't think we want to be energy farmers. And the energy farms that you see, what was it, Apple was 
thinking of building, they're going to build a new server farm, and the amount of energy consumed by a server farm is just incredible. And they were thinking of powering it via solar, but it turns out that it's going to take six and a half square miles of solar panels to power one of their server farms. Energy farming, maybe not. So again, look at your energy shed. We apply the permaculture rules to energy shed and to the idea of energy production. And maybe we become gardeners of energy, maybe a lot of different scales of energy production rather than becoming energy farmers. Another piece to look at is, is money, money that actually is tied to something real. And something really encouraging happening here are the hours banks. Uh, where an hour of my time is worth an hour of your time. Money that instead being tied to crazy derivatives of derivatives of derivatives is actually tied to something finite and real. So there's LETS systems, the local economic um, trading systems, uh, or hours banks in many cities. So money that is actually tied to something real and kept in the community, the wealth stays in the community. Another piece is applying our understanding of development patterns to local economies. You know, a developer goes in, puts up a thousand houses or five thousand houses or whatever it is, you know that certain things are going to happen. You know that near that development, you know, you're going to get a Costco and Walmart and Rite Aid, um, food stores, a home despot, um, all of these things are going to be happening there, right? That's the pattern. That stuff's going to show up. So I'll bet in that development of several thousand people, there's someone who knows how to run something like a Costco. There's someone, you know, there's someone who can make coffee for sure. You know, there's, there's a pharmacist. There are people like that. So why don't we get pattern literate about that and make those businesses local rather than waiting for someone to come in? Community scale permaculture, just projects going on. Um, this bottom illustration is a, a group called DePave who goes around taking up Pavement. I, I don't think they do it randomly, but although I think that would be kind of cool. But you know, imagine every other street in the city turned into a food forest. You know, just removing some of this pavement. But community scale, other projects that are going on that are really cool, public food forests. There's now one being built in Seattle that is a, a city park that is going to be a food forest. Um, there are a number of them in Canada. The Canadian, my Canadian friend said, hey, you're not the first. We've been doing this a long time. Food forests in city streets. This is Mark Lakeman, that architect who runs city or founded City Repair, um, his office in Portland. And his office is on a very busy street, so they don't grow a lot of food right on the parking strip, but they grow a lot of food right all around his office. And it's this lovely, food-producing, wonderful, wildlife habitat, fantastic environment. Community compost. There, there are a lot of folks who don't quite make enough, generate enough compost to actually have a compost pile. And I spotted this one in Seattle, uh, a compost pile out on the corner on the parking strip that a group of neighbors all contributed to so that they had enough. The key there is really good signs that explain exactly what to do and what goes in which bins. Um, and then a little bit further down the street, I saw this really great sign pointing to a daylily. <laughs> pointing out that, by the way, this too is food. All parts of daylily are edible. So really lots of fun. Community seed saving workshops. Kids love these because they can make a mess. You get to trade your favorite seed varieties. You get to know people who are into seeds or into gardens. And also community tool lending libraries are starting to appear in a lot of places. I, I don't need a 20-foot extension ladder more than twice a year, right, to clean out my gutters. Or a lot of tools, big expensive tools, I don't need that often, and yet we all own one. You know. So community tool lending libraries to take care of that. And the objection that's raised, of course, is, well, people are liable to steal them or they're going to break. And it's like, that's right. That might happen. So we design for that, right? When we come up to, with an objection to a plan like that, I'll bet we can solve it. That's the next step. Yeah, that'll happen. Let's be pattern literate. Let's understand that that will happen. So we design for that, you know, an extra fee or whatever it is. We figure out a way to, to recognize the fact that, yeah, someone will probably steal a tool every now and then. Education, a huge leverage point. I work with a guy named Michael Becker who lives outside of Portland in Hood River. And he took a permaculture course a long time ago just as he had started as a, uh, a middle school teacher. And he, he was so inspired and he said, I want to create a middle school curriculum completely based on permaculture. And he used the garden as the basis for 
history, geography, mathematics, science, and even manages to get an English class in there. And so one of the things that he did in, in this garden, an early project, was just to teach the kids uh, about numbers. They gave this, the class four thermometers, and one thermometer went in the greenhouse, and one thermometer went into a bucket of water, and one thermometer went in the soil, and another one just sat out in the open. And the kids tracked the readings on the thermometers for about two weeks, came in every few hours and took a reading. And by the end of that, you know, they understood, oh, the one in the bucket of water you know, only fluctuates really slowly, and one in the soil doesn't change at all, and the one in the greenhouse goes way up and then way down. And, you know, so they understood what all these numbers did. And then after they had mapped all this out, he said, okay, I'm gonna show you another way to represent these numbers, it's called a graph. And so the first graph they ever did was a four variable, incredibly fluctuating, insanely complex graph, except the kids got it. They totally knew what all these numbers meant. And his kids are so far ahead of the state and federal benchmarks now through this permaculture-based curriculum. And he won Oregon Middle School Teacher of the Year Award a couple of years ago. Um, the other teachers are beginning to adopt this curriculum. Actually, at first they were really jealous and was like, how come your kids go out and get to go outdoors all the time? And they're not doing the right curriculum. So Michael said, okay, give me your lesson plan for a week and I will give it to my kids and we'll see how they do. And so they got the lesson plan and then Michael said, okay, you can't go out into the garden until we finish this lesson plan. The lesson plan was completely done by Tuesday afternoon and the kid, for the week and the kids went out for the next three days and did the permaculture curriculum. So that was the end of that hassling Michael about not following the curriculum. So education that's really relevant and education that gets kids excited about it. He's got kids in his class and parents come in and say, my kid always hated school until she took your class and now she loves it. So I could go on with stories about Michael because he's amazing um, and we should get him down here to talk because he's really fun and he can show you how to do this stuff. So just strategies, thinking about how can we do some of this. And these are, these are pretty basic and straightforward, but just thinking about how to implement some of this. Um, in permaculture, the word observe is at the top of everything. We're modeling ourselves after natural systems. We need to find out what's in our environment, what's going on around us. So we observe and we assess. And so we try to understand what the resources are, the land, the people, the whatever it is that's there. We assess the skills and the technologies that are present and which ones are missing that we'd want to implement. The allies, right? A really important part of implementing anything is to fit, you know, identify the friendlies, right? Who's going to help you with this? Identify those people first. Cultivate allies. Cultivate help. And then locate the obstacles. You know, what are the ob obvious obstacles? What are the things we're going to fall over right off? Make sure we know what those are. And then get successful. You know, pick projects that you know are going to be successful first. Find the low-hanging fruit and, and make yourself happy. Get everybody charged up. Don't tackle the hardest thing first. Tackle something that you know you can win first to get momentum going. Um, and then really important one is who are the decision makers? Who are the people who you really need to be talking to about this? Who makes policy? Although I think a lot of people think of permaculture as about food growing and gardening and that sort of thing, it turns out that everything that we apply, that we learn from the garden or learn from ecosystems can be applied to almost everything else we do. So in permaculture, we're really talking about dealing with food and energy and water and shelter and waste, as well as what we call the invisible structures, things like security and spirit and culture and education and law and finance and all of those. And the idea is that we kind of, again, apply the zone system, is that we start personally trying to get all those things or some of them or one of them or whatever in alignment in ourselves, or we find a place to specialize in them. And then we move out to the local level and try and make sure that we're meeting our needs all around this flower successfully at the local level. And then we go and look at the, the more regional level as well. Another way to think of this, I mean, these are all the basic, you know, you could add some more things to this list, but I think these are kind of the basic things we need to have a really functional culture. And I think that if I went around this room and have everyone put their initials at where they are working, you know, are you working on regional waste issues? Are you working on local finance issues? Are you working on you know, personal food issues? These sorts of things. I'll bet everybody in this room could probably stick their initials somewhere on here and we'd have this thing all filled up 
and all taken care of. And actually, my friend Larry Santoyo, who I teach with a lot, has people do this in an exercise. You put your initials up here somewhere, um, and he calls this game, Why Should We Let You Live? <laughs> so, you know, bring something to the table, right? <clears throat> so, okay. I'd, I'd like to think that we've come a pretty long way here now that we're talking about solutions, come a pretty long way from the doom and gloom about the domestication of the human species that I, that I started this talk with. But I think it's really important to remember what we've lost. You know, these people who were the freest people in the world, that was the end, pretty much the end of that, and what that represents. And when I think about that, I, it, makes me, it makes me pretty sad, and I really, you know, I really feel what, what we've lost for that. So we have to start where we are, though. You know, we're here in this culture, in this place, and we start from this place. And permaculture, I think, offers a roadmap to where we can develop a life that, that we really are directly connected to spirit and where you know, we understand we're operating from the abundance model rather than the scarcity model. That it's, you know, where, where we understand that, that it's not the store and the job that support us, but it's the land and the water and the plants and the animals that supports us and in turn we support them. So really, and I think our task is to redesign civilization, and I think that the rest of the world, the, what David Abram calls the more than human world, is, is depending on us to do this. They're waiting for us to do this, to transform our relationship with the rest of the world. And I think what permaculture does is, is to begin to give us some of the tools to do that. And I think the fact that you're all here tonight means that you also believe some of the same things, that we, you know, we want to reconnect ourselves to these. I mean, I, you know, I want that connection to nature. I don't want to be insane because of that loss of connection with nature. So I hope that I've given you a glimpse of a toolkit that will allow us to create a culture that's really based on, not on scarcity, but based on abundance and is not grounded in fear, but is grounded in love and empowerment and a place that we can understand that we have enough and that we really belong here.